Keen's Journal Sometimes I hate myself. I hate my body. I hate the thing that my father made me. Everything that I've ever done has been to make him happy, proud. But the one thing that would actually make him proud is the one thing that I can never truly be. I am his greatest failure. But I wear that as a badge of honor now. Control has always been his greatest desire. And yet I am the one thing that he couldn't control, despite his best efforts. I have accepted that I can never be normal. I can't be a normal boy, I can't be a normal girl. He took that from me. But I'll be damned if I let him do anything else. This is my life, and he can't have it. Maybe it's just my freedom speaking. But for the first time in my life, I feel good. I was annoyed at first when Lucian stuck me with the new kid, but I've grown to like him. He's broken, like me. Well, perhaps not like me, but he's something that's not normal, something that can't fit in. It's honestly been good to see someone who's had it a bit worse than me. Not that I would ever admit that to him, of course. I enjoy making fun of him too much for that. He's the first person in my life that I feel I can honestly consider a friend. But how much of that is real? If he knew the truth, what would he do? Would he cast me aside like my father? Would he treat me like the freak that I am? In the end, I suppose it doesn't really matter. He'll never know the truth. Keen Serpent Chapter 7 I should set you ablaze with hellfire for barging in on me, Victor Corvale! Keen screamed. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know! He yelled back in self-defense, still facing the door. Well, maybe you shouldn't go bursting into people's rooms unannounced! This caused him to spin around in anger and pure disbelief. You're one to talk! He shouted, surprising himself that he turned around to face him. Or rather, her, again. Turn back around, she called out, and he immediately did. You blundering idiot, she yelled. He simply stood there staring at the door, mouth hanging wide open. Get out, he heard her shout as she ruffled around through a pile of clothes and began dressing. He followed orders, stepping out the large door and closing it behind him, staring wide-eyed down the hallway. He stood there, mind completely blank in shock for what felt like an eternity before he heard the door crack behind him and Keen say softly, You can come in now. He slowly turned around and met her eyes as she poked her head out of the door. Her wet raven black hair hung over her fallen and clearly embarrassed eyes. She retreated back into the room so that he could enter. She had dressed in a white tank top with a white long sleeve button up over it and trousers like she usually wore. She was still buttoning up the shirt over the tank top as he walked in. The full dormitory was a total of four large rooms. He entered into a wide sitting room with two fine leather couches and a wide coffee table. To the right was a massive bathroom complete with a full porcelain bath and shower. On the left, a large kitchen and full dining table that had various books and papers strewn across it. Then directly ahead was a large bedroom with a mahogany writing desk, a wall-to-wall -wall chest of drawers, a plush loveseat, and a king-size four-poster bed against the far wall, where Keen plopped down onto the foot of. There were no doors between any of the rooms, so Corvale sat down on the edge of the couch in the sitting area, still in full view of Keen sitting atop her bed. His mind still hadn't fully caught up with what was going on. You're a girl, he whispered softly. Glad to see that head wound didn't interfere with your vision, she said in her usual condescending tone. You're a girl, he repeated, trying to wrap his mind around it. Though perhaps it did cause some lingering mental damage. You're a girl, he asked, nearly in a shout. I don't know what I am, Victor. 
she shouted in reply. She closed her eyes and breathed deeply, not wanting to let her temper get the best of her. My father wanted a son and heir so badly that he tried to curse me into one after I was born. He almost thought it worked, too. My hair hardly ever grew. I was tall and thin, she said, motioning to her body. They even had me convinced I was a boy most of my life. I was sheltered, went to a prestigious private school. I had no way of knowing otherwise. Her usual snarky voice was replaced by bitterness and sorrow. No one ever knew. Most people still wouldn't. I always just thought I was a freak, until things started changing. I was 15, bit of a late bloomer, I suppose. I didn't actually figure out what was going on until a year after that. What did you do? Corville asked. I tried to rebel, even tried to wear a dress once. I was locked inside my room for two weeks after that stunt. Sixteen years, thinking you're one thing, thinking you're a freak. Have you any idea what that does to a person? He didn't. He couldn't even imagine what she must have gone through. Up until the war, he was always happy with his life. He knew who he was, who he wanted to be. Most everyone liked him and treated him with respect. Things were different now, of course. He felt alienated, like a freak. Keen had felt like that since birth. I'm sorry, he said. Oh, I don't want your pity, Victor, just like you don't want mine, which is why I've never given it to you. I just want to be normal, I guess. Her eyes fell. Corville knew that feeling now. But how could he treat her as normal now that he knew her secret? Not that he couldn't be friends with the girl. Cynthia obviously disproved that notion, but... But it didn't matter. No matter how much Keen had annoyed him in the past, she was right. She had never pitied him, never treated him as less than what he was. The least that he could do was return the favor. Thank you he said softly. She raised her head. For what? For treating me like I was normal, like I was a whole person. I owe it to you to do the same. She simply nodded softly. A thought ran through Corville's mind, and he chuckled to himself, causing her to glance up at him with a cold stare. What? she asked, ice in her tone. I was just thinking of all the girls who will be heartbroken if this ever got out, he said, smiling. She smiled back. A small but sincere smile, not the devious one she usually wore. When she smiled like that, she was actually... No, he couldn't think that. Not now. Her smile faded to horror. You mustn't tell anyone. If word got back to my father, well... I don't know what he would do, but I don't want to find out. Don't worry, Keen. Your secret is safe with me. And it was. You don't study law without being willing to keep a few secrets from time to time. Her face softened once again. They sat there in silence for several minutes. It wasn't even awkward, at least not for him. They both needed to think through some things, but she didn't seem to want to be alone just now. He stayed with her until they had to go for their first class of the day, Hermetic Philosophy. He made note of the fact that as soon as she left her room, her back straightened, her brow lowered, and her jaw set. Keen once again took on the appearance of the haughty and entitled brat that he knew all too well, as if this tall man and the girl that almost seemed small in her massive room were two completely different people. He couldn't imagine being forced to act like someone he was not, day in and day out, with the only respite being when he was truly and completely alone. Though he also supposed that everyone was like that to a certain extent, wearing a mask of responsibility around everyone, and it's not until you retreat into solitude that you become your true self. For Keen, it was just amplified tenfold. They walked to class together, with little more conversation than Keane's usual commentary on each student, teacher, and landmark. 
Corvale decided that he would try his best to pay attention to the class and take notes more diligently than he had been. He had to get to the bottom of this whole situation, and he couldn't do that through ignorance. The professor was more engaging than the Solomonic one had been to start off with. Even though he had moved on to practicals now, which Corvale found fascinating, as he was still unable to discern how they were able to create these illusions and tricks. This professor was also much younger and of Arab descent, with a finely cropped mustache and goatee. He talked a lot about alchemy, both physical and spiritual. He spoke about a text called the Emerald Tablet that had belonged to Hermes Trismegistus, the namesake of Hermetic philosophy. He spoke in great detail of the direct correspondence between different levels of existence, between the physical and the spiritual, between heaven and earth, or hell. He summed up the concept with the phrase, as above, so below. Corville found the concepts he discussed fascinating, though he wasn't sure how they related to their so-called art, but he was sure that would come with time. He met back up with Cynthia after the class and invited Keen to join them in their little impromptu get-together at Seely's Dray. Uh, does it have to be the Dray? Can't we just meet in an empty classroom or something? She asked. They invited us there. Wouldn't it be rude to reject now? Cynthia said while blushing. Corville couldn't help but chuckle. This gained him stern glances from both Cynthia and Keen, of course. When they arrived at Seely's Dray, Corville was surprised by its interior. He had come to expect grand architecture and ancient artifacts. This dorm, however, was utterly utilitarian. The walls and floor were plain and unfurnished. Exposed electric bulbs cast the whole place in a sterile glow. There was really nothing to note. Uncomfortably, it reminded him a great deal of a hospital or military base a place that served a very particular purpose and nothing else. When they entered the large common room, he was taken aback by its size. It was at least three times the size of Jagger's Nest's common room, and it was littered with tables and workstations in complete disarray. Cork and chalkboards dotted the odd scene with nonsensical scribblings, diagrams and images covering every possible surface. Students scurried from table to table or were huddled into dark corners, surrounded by books and scrolls. Corvale and Cynthia stopped in the doorway to take in the chaotic atmosphere, while Keen wandered in as if she had expected such a scene. Cynthia nudged Corvale and pointed to a desk where Hannah and Titus were huddled over. Hannah lifted her head at the exact moment and looked directly at them, startled, then smiled and waved them over. What is all of this? He asked as the three approached the desk. Titus looked up from his work, nodded to them, then turned to a large board that was half chalkboard, half corkboard beside them. This is Verindre, Hannah said, motioning to the world around her. Home of the Wanderers. Keen leaned over and whispered in his ear. Elsbeth Vereen Seely was a bit of a nutcase, but she was a genius. Many of those who end up in her house follow suit, she said in a slightly condescending tone. Hi, I'm Keen, she said to Hannah with a forced smile and extended hand. Yes, we all know who you are, Mr. Serpin, Hannah said back, taking her hand. What are you two working on? Cynthia asked. Hannah looked over her shoulder at Titus and chuckled nervously. <laughs> a lot, actually. We pretty much work on everything together here. Collaboration was at the heart of Lady Vereen's philosophy. Her and Oliver Rook basically invented the artist's tongue by themselves. We try to embody that here. A hint of pride shone in her voice and on her small face. Disappearances, Titus said from behind her. Come again? Corville asked, surprised at his interjection. We're working on disappearances. Yes, we all help out with everything, but that's our focus. Or oh, my focus, he said as he made several additional notes to the already cramped chalkboard. Keen's eyebrows arched. Disappearances. Care to elaborate on that? Hannah sighed. There's been a number of students who have gone missing over the past year, she said in a hushed tone. 
Verindre focuses on academic research and practical experimentation. This isn't our usual cup of tea, but it's become Titus's house project. She cut off and addressed the group as if giving an informative lecture. Verindre students each choose a project at the beginning of each semester to study and experiment with. We all help out to finish those projects. Generally, it's just a new type of spell or ancient translation. Occasionally, it's some new form of artifice or alchemical discovery. This is the first project like this we've had to... solve. She glanced caringly over to Titus. But we're making ground. Corville instantly took interest. Students going missing? Not only was this perfect for uncovering the dark secrets that he knew this school contained, but also he loved solving mysteries. Hannah continued to speak. Generally, we keep to ourselves and our research, but I did have ulterior motives for inviting you, Hannah said abashed to Cynthia. I'm doing a study on ancient forms of Indo-European magics and have been stumped lately on the druidic practices of the English Isle. There's a surprising lack of documentation, but since you're here, I was wondering if you would be willing to help out? Cynthia perked up at this and adopted a bright smile at the chance of spreading knowledge of her faith, something that Corvale had callously tossed to the side. He looked away from Cynthia as she excitedly began spewing information to Hannah, who was clearly taken aback by the instant reaction. Keen simply rolled her eyes and leaned against the desk. Corville still didn't understand their magic. He didn't really understand faith in general. He was a Christian, of course, but everyone was where he grew up. That was pretty much the only option. It was just something he did, something he was, something he never really thought about. Mysteries of the universe were out of his field of expertise, but mysteries of the mind and body, mysteries of man, that he understood. He walked over to the blackboard that Titus was continuing to scribble over, looking more closely at the names written down on it. These names, they're the ones who disappeared? He asked. Titus nodded in response. They're all girls, Corville noted. Titus stood up from where he was hunched over, making notes at the bottom of the board, and looked at him. Are there any other obvious observations you want to make? Corville felt a pang of indignation rising up inside of him. Look, Titus, I think we got off on the wrong foot. I want to be able to get along. Mr. Corville, outside of this building, everyone treats me a certain way. A horrible way. But a way that I can accept. Because I understand it. It's the way things are. And I can't change that by complaining. Inside this room... I'm just another student with another project. But you're trying to be something different. Something that I don't understand. He said, clearly agitated, but still trying to show respect. I don't mean any offense, Corvale said. It's just, I, I fought alongside a lot of- A lot of what? A lot of people like me? Learned that we bleed the same, we die the same? You think you understand us now? I'm sure you've been through hell, but so have we. The fire might look different, but it's still hell. Do you want my pity, Mr. Corvale? Corvale stumbled over his own thoughts and words, holding up the stub of his right hand. No. Then treat me the same, and we'll get along just fine. He turned back to the board. The words hit Corvale hard, mostly because he was completely right. Here he was hating everyone who pitied him, everyone who saw him as different, everyone who felt sorry for him. But then he turned around and did the same thing to Titus, trying to act like he understood or related to him, when in reality, he could never truly understand his pain, just as no one could understand his own pain. I'm sorry, he whispered. Titus looked back at him. I don't need your apologies either. He paused for a moment, thinking. But I could use your help. Yeah, of course. What can I do? He had never been part of a study group before. But that was exactly what this meeting had turned into, though very different than any he had heard of. Over the next few days, they met regularly in Seely's Dre and worked together. When he wasn't helping Titus figure out more of his mystery... 
Corvail even decided to try to do some academic studying himself. Keane had already given him a number of basic historical and practical analyses on their art, and she began to take her role as his tutor more seriously. Though he still didn't believe any of it, he found the lengths they went to to explain the science behind it fascinating. From what he had gathered, it was based on various ancient esoteric and mystical practices, such as Jewish Kabbalah, Christian Enochian magic, Egyptian Hermeticism, and Israeli Solomonic magic. Each of the disciplines specialize in certain techniques and philosophies. Solomonic magic focuses on communicating with and controlling demonic forces, forcing them to interact with the physical world and do the caster's bidding through the use of seals and other binding agents. Enochian magic was similar, but it focuses on angelic hosts instead, commanding angels and other benevolent spirits to intercede on the caster's behalf through the use of language, symbols, dreams, and codes. Hermeticism came from a very different background, where both good and evil forces coexisted and could be controlled interchangeably based on a person's beliefs and philosophy. The Hermeticists used alchemy and other techniques to communicate with spirits. Kabbalah seemed to be one of the oldest, however, and focused less on spiritual beings and more on the spiritual power itself. Kabbalists believed that words both written and spoken were able to change reality itself, since God himself spoke the universe into being. They sought to uncover words of power and decipher ancient texts in order to discover true meaning, true power, and true Kabbalah. These practices made up their art, and various texts and translations made up the language they called the artist's tongue. Keen was extremely gifted in Solomonic studies, as it was the primary focus of her entire family and lineage for hundreds of years. She did well at teaching him all she could about the practices. During their Solomonic studies classes and practicals, others had been able to reproduce the same effect of fire as Keen had before. Corville always watched closely to try and discern the trick they were using, but was yet unable to. During their study group, Hannah was able to demonstrate various spells as she had already earned her seal, which they claimed was the central focus of their art. Corville did wonder about the necessity of the seal in their tricks. It most likely had some form of hidden compartment in the sigil that could hold items or fluids needed for their illusions. Perhaps the one that Keen had worn the first day had some type of flammable gas that could coat her hand but not burn her when ignited. He had seen Hannah perform a number of smaller spells as well, such as levitating a pen. A thin string tied to the pen could have easily produced this effect, of course. He did wonder what the purpose of all of this was, however. Why all the mysticism around such simple tricks? and why was everyone else just accepting it? The only other person who seemed at all skeptical was Titus, but he had some strange beliefs of his own. He called himself a root doctor, which seemed like some mixture between an herbalist and a shaman of some kind, and he practiced what he called hodu. He created all types of tinctures and concoctions that were supposed to help with everything from a sore throat to improving test scores. Weirdly enough, from what Corvale could see, it actually worked. Though he was sure there was a logical and chemical explanation for his success. What Corvale didn't understand was what Titus called conjures. They were small packages of seemingly the most random things that he claimed could do all sorts of incredible feats. The jury was still out on those in Corvale's mind. He kept very detailed notes on everything that happened around them and rarely spoke. Sometimes he would mumble to himself incoherently in strange voices, but that was far from the strangest thing in this place. Cynthia fell fully into her studies. She consumed any piece of information she could learn, and when she wasn't studying, she was going into great detail of her people's entire history for Hannah. Corvail thought that Hannah may have bitten off more than she could chew with Cynthia. In class, Cynthia was one of the few who was able to recreate Keane's display in Solomonic practicals. She was obsessed. 
The only time her nose wasn't in a book or helping Hannah was when she was staring dreamily at Keen, or worse yet, Lucian. She treated him with a kind of awe and admiration that Corvale had rarely seen from anyone. Then again, if she did believe he was literally one of her gods, he supposed he could understand that. Corvale thought a lot about Lucian himself, his cool demeanor and air of superiority, yet a humility unbecoming of a man in his station. He was an enigma. He was kind yet stern at times, a perfect headmaster in Corvale's estimation. But he was also the epicenter of all that was transpiring in this unnatural place, and Corvale was determined to get to the bottom of it. In between lectures one Thursday afternoon, he decided to take Lucian up on his standing invitation and call upon him in his office, which Keane had already shown him the way to nearly a week before. He entered the large oval room, the red velvet walls shocking his senses. He spotted Lucian standing on the railed-off loft, facing away towards the wall of books and shelves, hands clasped behind him. Professor? he said, walking towards the desk and chairs positioned in the center of the room. With a quick motion, Lucian's head swiveled, being roused from deep thought. Then he turned around to face him. Ah, Victor, come in. I was just wondering when our next meeting would take place. He stepped to the narrow stairway and walked down to meet Corvale, his left hand outstretched. Corvale noticed that his seal was worn on his right hand today. He made a mental note of the change, but didn't recognize any significance of the oddity. He shook his hand firmly, then Lucian motioned for him to sit. I have some questions, he said to the older man as he took his own place behind his desk. I see. Then I hope to have some answers for you. As if forgetting something, Lucian swiftly rose to his feet again. Would you like some tea? None of that bland English stuff. I had this imported straight from China. Corvale didn't really understand the distinction, and he had always preferred coffee over tea, but didn't want to be rude. That would be great, thanks. Lucian walked over to a nearby table on which sat a stone tray with a steel kettle, a small teapot, and two little porcelain cups, smaller than any he had seen before. With a flick of Lucian's wrist, a flame ignited from his hands and the kettle screamed out its screeching call as the water boiled. Though the sound reminded Corvale of that terrible screech of bombs falling and bullets streaking overhead, his ghost was nowhere to be seen, and much to his surprise, no episode followed. Lucien brought the stone tray over and sat it on the desk in front of Corvale, and poured boiling water from the kettle into the teapot, where he could see a handful of loose tea leaves. After waiting for a few moments, he poured the teapot's contents into the small cups and set one in front of Corvale, then took a small sip himself. Now, ask away, he said, smiling sincerely with his lips and eyes. Corvale adjusted himself in his seat and produced his notebook from his jacket pocket to use for reference. He made a quick note regarding tea from China before beginning. I've been here over a week, and I still hardly feel any closer to figuring this place out. Everyone seems to have bought into all of this, swallowed hook, line, and sinker. I still don't know what's going on, but I'd like to take a crack at it. The tip of Lucian's lips curled in a humoring way. Then he said, By all means, and then gestured for him to continue, before taking another sip of tea. Corvale took a sip of tea as well which he found surprisingly flavorful and rich, even without milk or sugar. You mentioned importing this tea from China. I suppose it wouldn't be too difficult to import something else as well. Fireworks, perhaps? I hear the explosions they can create are incredible. Maybe they can even create ones that appear like dragons, which would explain your display when I first arrived. Lucian chuckled warmly, but said nothing. I haven't had an opportunity to examine a seal closely yet, but I think I have them figured out too. They both finished their tea, so Lucian poured another round into the pot, then after a few moments threw the strainer into their cups. Do you now? 
he said before setting the teapot down once more. Under the signet, there's a small reservoir for liquids or gas or string or a number of other things that can be used for your tricks. It would be elementary to fit in a small flint and steel or some other method of creating a spark. Elementary indeed. It's a magician's toolbox in a compact form, perfect for an illusionist. Lucian leaned forward, lacing his fingers together over the table. And you believe that everyone here has just unanimously agreed to pretend that it's all real magic? There's no other explanation, Corville said, sipping his second cup of tea. It was even more flavorful than the first, and seemed to take on new hints and flavors that he hadn't been able to pick out before. There is one other explanation. You simultaneously give us more and less credit than we deserve. You are not a man of faith. I understand that. But after all you've seen, I would surmise it takes more faith to believe as you do than to accept the truth. He leaned back in his chair and lifted his own cup to his lips, but stopped just short. How learned are you in matters of philosophy? He asked and then finished his sip. I find it interesting, but I've never studied it thoroughly. We shall have to change that. Have you ever heard of Occam's razor? No. It is the principle in which the explanation that requires the least assumption is often the most true. You could either assume that we have cultivated an elaborate lie and invented all sorts of devices to further this lie to some unknown means, and that everyone here is in on it except for you. Or you could assume that perhaps, just maybe, it's all true. He finished his cup of tea in another gulp. In your estimation, which is the simplest option? That question was preposterous, of course. The ramifications of their magic being real were infinite and terrifying. It may be only one assumption, but it was an impossible one. For all of this to be true, it would completely break down what I know about the world, about reality. Lucian hesitated, then poured a third cup for both of them. So then you believe that your perspective on reality is more important than the truth of it? The window from which you gaze upon the world is more real than the world itself? That seems almost selfish to me. And what of your newfound friends? Are their beliefs nothing more than fantasy and lies? He did believe that Cynthia's faith was fantasy, and Keen had lied to him before, about something very large. Why would he put it past her to do it with this? Of course, he understood why she had lied about her being a girl, but still. Even they have secrets, he said, his mind replaying his shocking encounter with her days before. A curious glance of recognition darted across Lucian's face. I take it you're referring to Master Serpin, or rather... Lady Serpin. This statement nearly caused Corville to spew the sip of tea he had just taken across the table. He stared at Lucian in wide-eyed disbelief. How do you know about that? He asked defensively. Lucian simply smiled, taking Corville's near outburst in stride. I know a great many things. I've known her family since before she was born. Her father even came to me asking for help cursing her. Of course, I refused, hence why he failed. He paused and looked deep into Corville's eyes, a thoughtful and knowing stare. I know a great many things about you as well. You claim to be a man of logic, yes? Yes, he replied, trepidation spreading across his own face. Can logic explain your own path through life? I have seen your medical and service records. He paused and pushed his tea to the side, then leaned forward, his eyes burning intensely. You shouldn't have been in that forest. 
You shouldn't have been on that boat. Or that bus. The words frightened Corvail. He didn't know where this was going and wasn't sure he wanted to know. All he could say was, I know. And he did know. He tried not to think about the terrible coincidence of events that transpired to put him in the front lines of the war, because the more he thought about them, the less sense they made. No one from the third draft even made it to Europe before the armistice. No one except for you. I know, he repeated. His trepidation turned to fear, and then to dread, as Lucian spoke. You were only there for two weeks before you were wounded and sent home. His face burned. His phantom right hand throbbed in pain. I know. And yet, even in your coma, you claimed to remember the assault on Montfaucon, Sedan, Cornet, and even Metz despite half of those battles taking place before you ever stepped foot on the continent. Corvale didn't fully know what he was dreading, but this revelation was certainly not what he expected. He stared back at Lucian's intense glare, his mind swirling, trying to piece together memories that were long shattered. What Lucian said made sense, of course. He didn't know the exact dates of all the battles his memory told him that he fought, but he had always thought he remembered more than what was possible. His thoughts passed over all the times he had been wounded, or worse, times that should have left scars more than the ones he already had. The church in Montfaucon collapsing on him, the machine gun nest opening fire on him on the approach to Sedan. Countless battles, countless wounds, countless deaths. The room flipped upside down, and he grabbed the table to stabilize himself. There is more to you than you realize, Victor Corvair. Much more. More than logic can ever tell. His ears rang, his head spun, his wounds burned. Then, in an instant, it all stopped, as Lucian quickly stood up. Well, I've taken enough of your time. I'm sure there are classes you'll want to attend. But if you ever want some more tea, be sure to stop by. Then, without realizing what was happening, Corville was outside of the office, and the door was closed. What just happened? He thought to himself. But within his mind, there was no reply. <laughs>